Let's face it, the past few years have been an unprecedented mess. The weight of continuous, heavy issues. Burnout, fatigue, confusion, stagnance. Sound familiar? What I decided to do was to have meaningful conversations with women I admire. It's the women in my life and yours that continue to thrive through whatever it is that life throws at them. I want to know how are they doing it? How are they getting there? And how can I glean a little bit of their wisdom? This is that. And that's what she said. Dr. Winona Hall, thank you so much for coming back <laughs> for another interview. Well, thank you for having me, I appreciate it. We got into such an excellent conversation last time. We got swept away with some of the historical uh, nature of your family. Um, this time, I really wanna know about some of your present work. You've got all kinds of things going on and you've just changed jobs. That was a really big segue. <laughs> Winona, yes. what you been up to lately? <laughs> well, quite a bit has happened, yes, since the last time uh, we talked. So, yes, and thank you for having me back. I think the um, first time really got to know me a little bit and how I landed here and how I got to be here and yeah. a bit of my life story. And um, at the time, I was teaching at um, UFE, where you are teaching as well, yeah. uh, with the Indigenous Studies. Um, department. I chaired the program there for, oh, I don't know, six or seven years, quite a while. Quite a while. Count. Okay. Um, but I was a full-time faculty member there for a decade. Wow. Yeah, it was, yeah, An entire decade. Soul, and a full-time faculty member, yeah. too. Yeah, full-time wow. faculty. I got to just pause for a second here to say this is a huge, massive load. Being a full-time faculty member is a huge job. She's just talking about it so casually, like, you know, something she did. Well, it is something she does every week. <laughs> for, for the 10 years. And as you know, UFE is very teaching intensive. Our normal course load for the year is seven courses. Yeah. And then to chair the program, um, you can negotiate for one or two releases, depending on where the program is at. And because Indigenous Studies was a relatively new program. I tended to have two releases, uh, but still a heavy workload chairing a brand new program and teaching five courses a year. And, and this brand new program, Indigenous Studies, yeah. that's that was something that you actually helped to launch I, at the university as I well. did. Well, I came in sort of, um, there was sort of a, a lot of legwork happening before I was hired at UFE. Okay. Um, but I was a sessional there, so I was okay. lucky I was able to be a part of the uh, yes. program working committee. So I was, kind of felt like a fly on the wall watching the beginnings of the program and watching. It was led by Shirley Hardman, okay. the yep. senior advisor on Indigenous Affairs. And she put together uh, this wonderful working committee, including community members, um, elders with knowledge and education. I love how... Winona has been part of, you know, the team, uh, including who she mentions twice, Shirley Hardman, someone else who is an incredible uh, mentor at UFV. Um, I love how she's been part of putting this entire program together, and it will be part of her legacy to UFV and to students out here in the Fraser Valley, you know, for the foreseeable future. I also really like what she said about her, you know, taking opportunities. So even when she was um, doing sessional work or um, work that that wasn't at the sort of higher levels of the employment scale, as it were, um, she took those opportunities to learn and to be in those rooms and to join, um, you know, to join in where she could. And I really admire that about her. Allies, Indigenous yeah. Um, people at the university. <clears throat> and so together, they yeah, they put together this wonderful program and put yeah. the proposal together. And then I ended up finishing my PhD right around when they were looking to hire somebody for the program. So it all just a perfect fit. Yeah, it was. It, well, was. it was almost like it meant to be in some ways. Yes, and I, I love what so. you said about, you know, starting as a sessional and taking that opportunity to be in those rooms and to really just become part of that process. Yes. I love it, that. Yeah. Okay, so you it this was. program launched and you, yeah. you, you were in charge of it for t 10 years. I was. So in the beginning, uh, the department, the department, the program, you? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> consisted of c'est moi. <laughs> so that was a little challenging, but I did have a lot of um, support and a lot okay. of allies 
to help out as we started putting the courses together and um, making sure to offer courses. We had our first two graduates um, the very first year because wow, they exciting. before the program was official they were already kind of doing the courses and right. okay. figuring so, so yeah the first year we had two two um, graduates right away so that was wild neat. so yeah it was really interesting watching and being a part of developing and watching that program grow and I was really honored to be a part of it yeah and yeah, UFV is actually I feel looked at as a front runner oh, in terms of def indigenization. Definitely, and I it has a lot to do um, not just with faculty like myself and uh, wonderful hires like mm. um, Shirley Hardman who works like <gasps> I don't even know when that woman sleeps like just works. <laughs> She's tirelessly. magical. I don't yeah. think she does sleep. Yeah. <laughs> just to make things happen and to bring people together, together. when needed, and um, and then. There's some really great allies at okay. UFE as well. And then on top of all of that, UFE has um, really authentic, sincere relationships with the local Stalo communities and the oh, local indigenous well communities, yeah. um, including uh, Métis as, as well. So UFE does a really good job of being grounded, staying mm. in the community, um, nurturing those community partnerships, bringing people together to make things happen. So. I really love that. It makes me feel yeah. really proud um, to, to be there yeah, um, and be. and that, you know, other universities from across Canada are sort of looking there. Yeah. However, however, you're not there anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> so wait a second. Right. Uh, back up. Okay. okay. What happened? So <laughs> uh, I think I mentioned in our, our first interview about my senior supervisor for my grad program. Yes, at, um, SFU, Dr. Ted Pallas, wonderful. Who, another wonderful ally yeah. and really supported um, me throughout my graduate work. He had approached me a quite a, several, several years ago, oh, okay. asking me if I would ever consider leaving UFE. And at the time, I was a hard no. I was like, no, okay. I, I don't think I would ever leave UFE. Um, I always kind of thought that I would land at UBC or SFU. Oh, interesting. UFE kind of made me this offer. I couldn't refuse. They tailored the position according to my expertise in Indigenous governance and leadership. And look what you accomplished yes. there. I mean, so I was very content yeah. and happy um, at UFE. So at that time, it was a hard no. Yeah, okay. And then he approached me again a couple of years later. <laughs> he was not done yeah. with his requests. Yeah. Okay. And again, at the time, I was like, oh, okay, now he's asking me a second time. Let me think about it. And then as I was thinking about it, I was like, no. It was still no. No, like, why would I? And then we, we met again, though, for and we talked a little bit more about it. And honestly, I was trying to think, because I, I knew I wanted to talk about my transition to SFU. And I was trying to think about, at what point did I, like, yeah. okay, I'll consider it. Yes. And I honestly don't know. Okay. I, but at some point I did. At some point I was like, you know what? I think I would consider. I want to draw attention to this process, you know, this awakening in her mind um, as she's talking about getting asked about this job for a second time now. Um, maybe it's not that hard no anymore. Maybe she's starting to open up and, and consider this. And I love how we talk about um, how this plays out for her. Um, and yet, you know, she, even in her own mind, wasn't sure about what her own future was going to look like. I think that's probably a very relatable thing. Okay, um, so there's to SFU. a shift inside yeah. your realm of thinking. Yeah. It wasn't, it was so subtle that you, yeah. it's not even clear when it sort of gained no. critical mass to sort of turn you over to, okay. Yeah. But I it was, it was brewing. It, I, okay. it must have been, you know, okay. it must have been. And it could have been, uh, you know, a few things, like we were talking earlier about UFE being teaching intensive. Yeah. And how, um, like, you really enjoy teaching and you enjoy um, students. And, and I'm not saying I don't. <laughs> but I don't have the same enthusiasm that you have, right? Okay. Like, oh, the more students, the better. And, oh, I'm teaching three courses this semester. Whereas I'm like, oh, my God, three, three courses. courses. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. So, We're all different. Yeah. <laughs> and so... But, um, that is one thing, though, about which I really appreciate about UFE is when I first started, when I look back, I was a horrible professor. I was horrible. Yeah, right. Does anyone else describe themselves like this? 
Um, that's not true. I well, know that that's not true. <laughs> well, when I think about how I teach now. Okay, as compared to, yeah. Oh, what a difference. Yeah, okay. And UFB was really good at helping me make that journey. Yes. There's so much yes. support. There UFB really is. To become a better um, professor and learn how to relate the best with your students. Because I also like how UFB has this, anybody can learn. Yeah. We'll teach anybody. Yeah. And I love that philosophy. Yeah, I love that too. So there's all those different dynamics in the classroom because you have all different types of learners at yep. different places, different, different spaces, ages, different ages. Yeah. So yeah, I really appreciated um, that and have become a good, a, a, a really good professor now at, cool. at this point. Nice. But I, I still really miss the, the, Reading yeah. and the researching. That good old sit back at the desk yeah. and just like soak it in. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Philosophy. Yes. And even read new books in my area. <gasps> like I'm yes. watching new new books coming out in my field. Like, oh and they're stacking up. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we all get a chance to read them? And they're they're piling up. This perspective of knowing your skill set and knowing your passion and not wavering from it. That's something I will always admire about Winona. And so I think that was always in the back of my mind. Yeah. And also knowing that, yeah, just because I am now a good teacher doesn't mean that I have to just teach, right? Because it absolutely it sort of isn't my, um, um, it's not my my gift You're, in life. I'm good at it. Yeah, Don't get okay. me wrong. I have, I've changed lives of so many students. Mm -hmm. I've had so many students just thank me, some even years later. Wow. Some cool. years later have sent me an email and said, I want to apologize for the course evaluation I wrote for you. Oh, I want you to know that I completely, it was supposed to be a course evaluation, but I used it to evaluate you. And everything I said about you, I want to take back. That now is that something I'm, else. Yeah, now that I'm working in my career for the last few years, now I see I why see. you were teaching us that What did now. that feel like? What did that... Um, in, a, in a way, I was happy that the student had the courage to come back. I was happy for that, uh, but those she's not alone in those really negative evals that I, that I get. I those get. Too. Do you really? Yeah, yeah. Those are Who hard. Would ever give you a <laughs> negative evaluation? <laughs> you can't please everybody. I guess oh. maybe that's the. <laughs> I'm really surprised. It hurts so hard. <laughs> um, the majority of my I'm sure there's there's uh, one or two that are are aimed at me personally maybe. But I find that the majority of my negative evals are coming from a really racist place. Okay. So that yes. makes it hard. How do can you separate that? Can you sort of step back from it? I mean, not that that's really worth condoning anyway on any level. I try to, but it's it's hard. Yeah. Because as a uh, and I think that was also part of it at UFA. As much as a wonderful place as it as it is, I'm teaching from an Indigenous perspective. Mm. I am an Indigenous mm. woman. I'm Stalo, teaching from within my Stalo worldview because I don't know any other. That's all I can it's do. your identity. Yeah. It's who you are. Exactly. Yeah. I can't leave it outside the classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As if you can't, right? No. <laughs> and I'm teaching Indigenous content to largely non-Indigenous students. Right. Very challenging. The additional challenge was I was teaching Criminology students, yep. okay. social work students, teacher candidates, and history students. Okay, so huge very diversity. challenging groups to teach. Okay, yeah, very. lots of opinions, uh -huh. lots of free yeah. free speech expression. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and in the context of an Indigenous studies program, observing racism from your students, that must have been... Tr trick. I mean, how do you even deal with well, that? Well, like now, because the other thing is moving the program along and then finally getting our, they're called IPK courses. That yes, feed Indigenous, into the Indigenous People's Knowledge. Indigenous People's Knowledge. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of things that happened to me. One was I was able to go into like Bella Kula uh -huh. and partner with the MVIT wow. college and teach some of our UFV IPK courses uh -huh. to 100% Indigenous students. Wow. Which I'd never done before. So that really helped me understand what was going on in my classrooms with largely non-Indigenous students. Okay. Because now I have the experience of teaching all Indigenous students, 
same material, and what a difference. My evals were like 4.85, so wonder, like just. You were speaking their language in yeah, a way. You yeah. were coming at it from a framework that made that sense. sense to them. And I was adding to their their, their knowledge view. pile yeah. Yeah. already, right? Instead of challenging their knowledge pile, I'm adding to their knowledge pile. That is so And it made big. a huge difference because the ones that did provide me with how to improve yeah. were sincere. I found this part of our conversation to be so interesting. Um, such a different experience in teaching um, Indigenous students from a framework of Indigenous ways of knowing and being, um, and then a room of students who are, you know, mostly colonial based and educated in that way, but then also the rooms that have representation of both. I love how she's had all of these experiences and that's really been able to um, make her that that well-rounded um, educator, yes, but also that writer um, and that thought thought you know thought leader in this field um it's it's really cool that she had all of these diverse experiences as an instructor and they impacted on her in different ways and those oh, are so helpful very right oh, how interesting yeah, yeah. i would imagine that the experiences are are diverse between and this was for a smaller college that yeah. you were teaching there yeah. okay and and now then at sfu being one of the largest in British Columbia, maybe almost even in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, are you teaching similar material there now for yes. a program in so Indigenous Studies? So I will be teaching um, entire, only Indigenous Studies courses okay. at SFU. Not saying that I couldn't at UFB. UFB okay. also told me that I didn't have to teach the CRIM, the history, the social work, all those other students, okay. that I could focus strictly on my own department and my own program. Um, but part of my plan there was I wanted to teach criminology students because um, the majority of them think that Indigenous peoples are overrepresented within oh, the prison system yeah. because of us. They don't understand the systemic issues that need to be addressed. So as an Indigenous criminologist, I'm able to yes. address the systemic discrimination. Social workers, right, instead of just, oh, Indigenous children are overrepresented within the child welfare system because of residential school or because Indigenous peoples, all those negative, yes, I don't even want to say them because it's just yes. so not true. Yes. And, um, and uh, I love your perspective of, of coming at it from a systemic lens yes. and coming at it like we can't just have Indigenous students learning about Indigenous things in the Indigenous program, that continues that division. We must have criminology and history yep. and teacher candidates. Yes. This is critical. Yes. And I, I mean, it's so inspiring to see you working from that lens, mm -hmm. but it's also, it, I can only imagine and I can hear from you the difficulty yes. that you've encountered in that. Yes, it, it's emotionally draining. Mm. The emotional labor is not accounted for. Yeah, yeah, fair. The emotional labor is not accounted for. What a beautiful statement. And so, you know, and as I'm planting these seeds in students, because in those disciplines, they're, they will be working with Indigenous peoples. Yes. So going through that decolonizing work, challenging those racist thoughts, yeah. um, thinking of ways we can actually change the system, because when yeah. we think about systemic discrimination, well, a system in and of itself doesn't discriminate. It's our application of okay. that system I like that. in the work that we do. Okay. So we can actually change systems okay. like as that. individuals working within the criminal justice um, field, working within child welfare, yes, uh, working within the schools, the K-12 system. But those are very challenging disciplines because these, these students in these disciplines are coming in with... Yeah. Right, and a then I come along and focus. go, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that can be very challenging. And I almost remember that too from being in those undergrad years of just, I, there were times when I didn't even want to look at the figures on the pages of the textbooks because I'm like, nope, I just got to get through this passage. Like, don't distract me yeah. from anything yeah. that I got to know here. Yes. And would you say that that in and of itself is a, a Western characteristic, like, or not Western, but sort of a non-Indigenous characteristic? Yeah. I would, yeah, I think so, like a sort of a Western style mm -hmm. of learning. 
So whereas with um, where we're at right now in terms of decolonization, I know mm. the buzzword is reconciliation, but I don't even think we're ready to even start that yet. Like we really have to do a lot of this decolonizing yeah. work first, and it does require us to just stop and not just have that linear yeah. way of understanding material, right? Taking time yes. to... Yeah. yeah. This is uh, this model of, I teach you, you learn that thing, yeah. and now you can go teach it to others. Yeah. It's not sort of... It, uh, the Indigenous approach is such a holistic yes. approach. Yeah, that's a good way of putting yeah. it. So. Um, and honoring the emotions. Right, And a yes. lot of students oh, I love that. don't want to, like, and I let them know, um, you're going to feel some things as we yeah. work through this colonial history. It's not Stalo history, it's colonial, it's colonial history. history. Yeah. You're going to start feeling, you're going to might feel some guilt, you might feel sadness, you might feel yeah. anger, you might even feel apathy, which is still a feeling, yep. right? Yeah, um, indifference, same, like these are all reactions to yeah. me. And you have to take the time to process those. Because otherwise what I find, students were taking those negative emotions that they're rightfully feeling, and like, it's your fault. Right, needing it's to assign fault. blame. Yeah. Winona yes. is biased. Winona <laughs> only promotes the stuff. That yes, <laughs> the the bad news yeah. stories in a way. Yeah, uh, and so much of what you're saying is really resonating for me because I, you know, during our trustees conference that we went, we had such powerful keynotes about the the nature of being a Canadian that exists at this point in history. How can we, you know, in our systems of education and, and various others as leaders, how can we begin to have these conversations? We must have them. Yeah. And we don't need to blame each other. We weren't, you know what I mean? We were, weren't alive necessarily even at the time. Yeah. But we, it's our duty yeah. to acknowledge right. and, yeah. and consider the yeah. emotions of it. Yeah. How do you sort of approach yeah. that? Yeah. I really like that because some people are like, I might not have be responsible for it. I may not have developed or done it, but I certainly as a citizen have a responsibility to try to fix it and improve yeah. things for sure. Yeah. I think the um, yeah, the teacher candidates were probably the, the toughest group that I taught. Interesting. Because they're they already have their degrees at at the time. So they're coming into my um, class in their credentialing year, thinking they know about indigenous youth and learning. But as I'm teaching them in the way that I teach, they're realizing, oh boy. Because yeah. literally, this just boggled my brain where teacher candidates would think that, oh, Indigenous learners belong in the special needs category. Oh, wow. Um, are that, are you kidding me? <laughs> we are not special needs. We're Indigenous learners. Yeah. We might have a different style and a different, different way of framework. learning. <laughs> Being referred to as special needs but also from the perspective of an educator who was giving, you know, providing that material, not open to receiving feedback on that material or material related to it. Like, um, I don't know, someone's lived experience, the lived experience of someone standing right in front of you. Um, I wonder if at the time young Winona knew how incredibly courageous and uh, bold she was being. I bet that teacher's life was never quite the same. And the reason why, I like how Gwen put it, when, okay. um, there's like a 70% dropout rate from graduating grade 12. Yeah. Gwen put it, it's not a dropout rate, it's a push-out rate. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Fair. Being yep. pushed out of the system. And it can be as simple as learning things that are not true about Indigenous peoples. Yes. When you have a teacher teaching stereotypes and furthering stereotypes... Of course, the Indigenous learners are going to get up and leave the classroom mm -hmm. and probably not come back, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, and I would also say too, the, the you know, young people in in sort of their passionate ways of moving forward, they are more likely to call out some some yeah. of that behavior in yep. their teachers, or you know, and I'm really encouraged by that. Yeah, it's it's um that's hard. Yeah, and I can recall, I don't think it, when I was a young person, I would have had the the courage, but again, of course, I was in that that framework of of oh, I shouldn't, you know, disrespect those people telling me what to do. Yes, <laughs> so, yes. Um, rich, beautiful conversation. We're going to take a short break okay. and come back with some more excellent wisdom from the beautiful Winona Hall. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> All 
All right, we are back with Winona Hall. We have been having a, a beautiful conversation about all kinds of aspects of your life and work. Um, why don't you take us through how you came to be uh, in this new position at oh, okay. SFU? Yes, exciting new new chapter in my life. So it definitely was not an easy decision um, to make, that's for sure. And when I was approached and asked if I would consider moving to SFU, um, I thought this was like the third, fourth time that I'd been asked. So I thought, I'll, I'll have a look. What? There's no harm in dabbling and looking. And Pause. And this is such a cerebral way of processing um, what it means to tackle those, those hard things in life. You know, those things that really define us. Um, I love the way she was just like, I am not going to, I'm not wasting time here. I'm ready. I'm, I'm not ready. You know, I'm not playing. This is my life. I've won. Go. <laughs> love it. That never happens, okay? In academia, wow, you're amazing. Like, what wow. never happened? Like, people are literally headhunting you for oh, a job. Okay, so that's amazing. It is very amazing, and <laughs> wow. I think. Okay, sorry, I'm yeah, and I like, I'm very conscious of that because oh, yeah. I know a lot of non-indigenous academics that are completely brilliant that do not have full-time positions yet. It's right, so wow. they're. Um, for me, it's that because I'm indigenous, not only am I indigenous, I have the lived experience. I've grown up indigenous. I'm stalo. Everything that I know is within indigenous content. My PhD, my master's, yes. all in indigenous content. So that puts me in a very special place in this age of reconciliation, mm. where I literally could probably, and all of us indigenous academics are in this position right now, where we could go anywhere and and people would find a spot for us. So that definitely is a, a good thing. Rightly and I so. Hope, yeah. Hope that encourages more Indigenous yes, students to get to, out there, get your graduate degrees, go on, get that PhD. That's it, right? There's 101 jobs out there for you if, if you... They're see, they're watching you yes, and seeing you, yes, you know, yeah. you're leading yeah. next generations, yes, really, yeah. of, of Indigenous yeah. students. It's a good position to be in. Oh, I bet. So, and having said that, yeah. um, I did have to compete for the position okay which okay. I also knew I'm like oh I'm gonna be up against some stellar candidates for for this so then I decided you know what apply yeah because a cha change is always good and if they offer you the position then start putting thought into whether or not you're gonna make the move okay so I decided fair enough. to do it that way okay so so even after you had applied you were sure you were sort of like okay it could go that way or or not or not okay. well what ended up happening is as I was going through the hiring process because as you know it's not just a simple one hour interview it's a million <laughs> it's a of lot they of put time. you through the hoops and days meet a lot time, of people sometimes. days of interviewing and presentations and it was as I was working through all of that I was becoming more and more invested in I want this position I want to move to SFU as I was meeting the people and okay. getting and also just stepping back onto a campus that I spent so many years at as an undergrad. An informative time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It must, did it, did it sort of just start feeling like yeah. it was it did. the way to go? It did. It did. And then that was making it worse for me because now I'm like, no, I want the job. What if I don't get it? Exactly. <laughs> so oh. that was uh, so many emotional roller coaster pieces going on through. And then also through, <clears throat> through that interviewing process. There's personal things going on in my life. Life as is happening. Well. Yes. Like, you know, there's some, um, some um, like death in the family. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, our, yeah. our family dog. First time that we mm. lost a family dog that oh, had to be, be put down due to old age. So all these things are going on, but it's life, right? Yeah. So China just doing my best. I'll be darned if they don't offer me the position. <gasps> oh. what, tell me about that moment. What happened? Oh. Where, did you get an I, email? Oh, no, what? so they use a headhunting service, okay. um, and the, the lady, I can't remember the name of the service, I wish I could give them a shout out right now, because she was wonderful, so cool. uh. her name was Ella, and from the beginning of my application, all the way through to um, the offer, she was there for me, like oh, cool. my support, my... That's so she really was cool. the one that was that called me to let me know that I was the successful candidate, and... Yeah, it was just, it was an amazing feeling. So I just rode that high for a couple days. Okay, yeah. 
Then reality sucked. Yeah, like, okay, <laughs> now the plans, the plans. And now I have to tell my dean at UFE. Oh, yeah. That was the hard, it was that, that was like, yeah. oh. Because I've built up so many great relationships at UFE. As we mentioned earlier, the Indigenous Studies program yes. is in such a it's wonderful your place. baby in a way. Um, there is like three new excellent Indigenous hires. <sighs> Um, all women, not that that's Amazing. what, but in strong, great. intelligent, <laughs> heartfelt indigenous women, three Incredible. of them. And then, and me, like I'm in my field of bumblebees and I'm going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so but in a way, it's almost like you set it up so perfectly to well, move on. I, I didn't remember a group yes, of, of course. Us, a the, group. The, yes. It was a yeah. whole team of people Fair working enough, yes. together to make all of this happen. So yeah, so that was hard. And so I did do that. And I, I'm, you know, my exit from UFV probably wasn't the best. I could have handled it better, but I'm not good at goodbyes. I don't do goodbyes. So I did let my dean know, and then I just kind of slipped out the back door. Fair, <laughs> so, fair. And because I'm still in territory, I'm still going to see everybody. Well, it's exactly. Not a goodbye. It's and not it's a goodbye. I was just thinking, probably in a lot of your work, your research capacity, various student advising, I'm sure there will be a lot of overlap. I think so, um, exactly. And possibly students that graduate from the program at UFE may then come to, to SFU, SFU and yes. study with you. Yes, exactly. Oh, exactly. And so for the, you've been in your position for a f just a few months now. Yeah, so I started mid November. Mid November, yeah, okay. And we're now in to February, so my first course started in January. Okay. So I'm teaching one course this semester, nice. and then in the fall, I begin my duties as chair of the department. So I also get this time just to kind of get to know the department a bit. The um, current interim chair will be my mentor. The outgoing chair is hands-on with me. Give uh, like it's just it's such a great a, team. I just feel fully supported. Uh. I'm just I'm really excited excited oh. about the change even though going through it there were actually a, a couple times where I just like sat straight up in bed in the middle of the night what am I doing like dreading my decision going to have I made a mistake wow. what am I doing what does that feel like when you're oh. really questioning yourself like that it's like um I had to just do the mental juggling act of yeah. how does it feel now moving towards something new and how does it feel to stagnate? I love this metaphor for getting through the hard things in life. I don't want to stagnate. I don't want to you know, be standing still for too long. Um, having this desire to constantly be pushing forward in her career and what she's learning and, uh, and doing. And certainly you can see that about her in many aspects of her life, not just in her academic work. Okay. So that would yes. help me. I don't want to stagnate. Yeah. I, I don't, I need to move. And as scary as this is, I ended up reading this. I'm part of a book club. Oh, I cool. ended up reading Fairy Tale by Stephen King. Oh. The book club picked it. I didn't pick it. Nice. Good book though. But there's a part in the book where the main character is moving through this dark tunnel, not knowing what he's moving towards. That's how I felt. Uh -huh. I felt like I was in this dark tunnel moving towards something I don't know what. And there was a time where I'm like, I should turn around and head back to UFE. I should just turn around and head back right? to what I know. Do How do you find, like, do you have faith? You're just like, okay, I'm just going to keep going. Yeah. Like, wh what does that look like in yeah. your mind? Just, yeah. I'm going to just, yeah. just, just keep moving. Just keep moving. Keep going. Yeah. Just keep going. Trust. Yeah. Tr yes. Right? Okay. Have some trust and just know, as I mentioned in the first um segment just always believing in my intuition and my yes. gut feeling because I believe in that right so did your that. ancestry helping you and guiding you uh. and then sure enough I got to a certain place in the tunnel I could see the light so I'm like okay <laughs> and I don't think I'm fully in the light yet I'm still moving towards that but <laughs> it's feeling better and better all just the time. adjusting and as I was mentioning before the interview, the other day I was sitting there writing, working on an article, an article that I started a couple of years ago and just never got the time to finish it. Uh, so I'm sitting there and uh, four hours later, I'm like, oh my God, I should get to work. And then coming to the realization, this is my work now. I get paid to write now. Eureka. Like yeah. that is, that must have just been a huge yeah. moment. I can imagine. Yeah. So you sort of feel guilty almost for spending four hours doing this thing. Yeah. But, but wait a second. That's actually 
what my job is now. I need to publish. Sort of like you won your life in a way. Like, okay, today I win. Yeah. Um, well, okay, yeah. and I, I just want to pick up a couple of other things because I, I you are winning. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's so cool. That's so good. We mentioned good. your family, though. Yeah, we yeah. mentioned that life kind of continued to go along yeah. even during this time. And, yeah. you know, in my mind, half of me is thinking, okay, you must have just been in a vacuum dealing with this enormous amount of work. But no, of course not. You have three children. Yeah. You are a busy person in our community. So yeah. how did that go with yeah. all of those extra commitments? Uh, really well. I okay. think all all areas of my life fully supported me in <gasps> this change and in this move. I like the way she says all areas of her life were supporting this transition for her, this change. Um, the way that, you know, her community, her greater community was coming together behind her in this way. Really powerful for, for me. Before I even applied, I did talk to my, all three of my kids about it. To oh, you see did? How they okay. felt about it. And all three of them were like, do it, mom. Do they it. Were. Yeah. Tell me about so, that a little bit. And how old are they again? Um, so my oldest is 23, okay. Jade. Yeah, She's Jade. in her Master's of Education program. <gasps> so and cool. then my oldest son is Justice. He is managing a movie theater in Kelowna, oh, BC. Cool. So proud of him. He's the first one to move out. Okay. That's like, oh, you don't know. Oh, yeah. See, you feel. <laughs> oh, I just, yeah, I cried. I still <laughs> oh, cry. Not yet. Not yet, baby. No. <laughs> I still cry. I was on my, uh, I'm doing office hours online right now. Okay, yep. And I was on office hour and nobody was on there. And my son texted me. So I took the text because I'm just, and then he's like, love you, mom, miss you. And then I started crying. Little tear. Then a student. Oh, oh my God! Oh no! Sometimes out of touch. So yeah. proud of him. So so proud of him. Wow! And did, is he? Did he move out there all on his own? He did. Yeah. Yeah. He found a place. He has a friend, uh, one of his best friends from high school, going to UBCO. Okay. So they're roommates, nice. and they they've known each other since childhood, and like he's doing just living thing, his best life, right? Yeah. yeah. And <sighs> then my youngest is Alexis. He is 18, and he's in his first year at UFE. Ooh. Oh, exciting. Yes. How's he enjoying that? Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. He comes home with interesting stories from every single class. I love hearing <laughs> That's them. so cool. <laughs> right. They start talking. Yeah. I mean, did, were they were they not big talkers when they were little? I don't know about yours. My boys didn't don't really say too much. <laughs> yeah, especially when their sister's around. Uh -huh. She does all the talking <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so yes, they are starting to talk on their own okay. now, which is good. Oh, and I love how you had those individual conversations with each of them. Um, and you said that, you know, they were all a resounding yes, yeah. that you should take it. Yeah. Was there anything that they said to you um, during those conversations that, that surprised you? I think um, I, their full support of me and them wanting me to be happy <laughs> and them knowing me, I really appreciate it. Like, they <sighs> know I'm an academic. And when I say that... They know, like they've watched me read. They were with me when I wrote my dissertation. Yes, yeah, so they're, so yes, they they're with know, you. Yeah. They know. So that conversation happened with my oldest, with Jade, about the writing. Because I did tell her, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to write again. Like at SFU, you have to publish at UFV. It's not such a big thing because we're okay. more focused on the teaching. Right. Okay. And so we, her and I did have to have a bit of a heart to heart there because she does remember the last time writing, I was pulled away from her, and okay. she didn't want that happening again. Okay. So I told her, yes, no, I will make sure to find a way where when I'm writing, I'm writing, but I still You're have still time. Here. I'm not going to 100% disappear <sighs> from your life so I can write. That's not going to happen Because ever again. even you've grown through your process, yes. and you know that you don't necessarily have to lock yourself in some kind of room and be away from everyone in order to do productive Well, I work. do in order to okay. write. <laughs> but okay. I actually do. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, but I now know that I part I can it. put that aside yeah. and go to, go deal with my human relationships, which are equally important, and then go back and to then my go back room. to it. <laughs> <laughs> go back to my cave. <laughs> I hear you. I gotta wear earplugs. I really yes. Yeah, I like to. I was talking with Barris earlier. I like to like just get into a zone. Yes. Right. Yes. And, yeah. Yes, get into the zone in order to be productive. I love that. And sometimes it takes a while. <laughs>
It's it's almost a little bit of euphoria I find when I get into a yes, rhythm with it and yes. it's just the info starts yeah. flowing and I yeah, yeah it's it's kind of difficult and to explain. And you want to stay in there for as long as you can. Yeah. It's like the runner's high. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I would yeah. imagine that it is yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so, well, speaking of runner's high, what kinds of uh, things do you do to keep yourself, you know, moving, happy, hobbies? <laughs> um, you you recently went traveling. With your family, right? Somewhere. We did make a trip to Big White. Oh, okay, Big White, so, amazing. Do you yeah. ski? I do. Okay. My kids board. I ski. Okay. I want to learn to board. That's on the burner. We'll see. Okay. Um, but this trip had been planned the year before, but the remember the Coquihalla was washed out. Oh yes. So we had to delay it by okay. a year. So in. That worked out in our favor too, because then we added a couple nights and we added another room and we brought more people and it was just, it was a wonderful trip. I love that. Basically just kind of rolling with the punches, you yeah. know, um, the perspective of, okay, it's not going to happen this way, but we're just rolling it with it and going to make it work. Turns out better. Way. Oh, Winona, yeah. thank you so much for coming back and oh, for, for sharing s these amazing updates. I mean, I, I guess if there was one thing I wanted, maybe we'll end on is, um, you know, the young women and, and, and young people that are watching this and sort of seeing you big winning, mm -hmm. um, although you're very, you know, you're very humble about it, but I don't know, what, what kinds of words of advice do you offer to, you know, young people? We, we are seeing our undergrads and our, you know, high school students still in crisis. There's a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What do you say to them? I would say find something in your life that brings you joy. Mm -hmm. Find something that you enjoy doing and just feeds your soul, so to speak, and um, focus on that and just yeah. and, and do that, whatever that may be, whether it's writing poetry, singing, mm -hmm. writing, teaching, acting, Fixing toilets, whatever yeah, it yeah. is, just focus in on, on that because I truly believe we were put on this planet for joy. Ah. I know there's terrible things out there we have to address and deal with, but I truly believe that we were put here for joy. And we can curate that yes. and we can keep coming back to yes. it. Mm. Yes. Winona Hall, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I'm pleasure. so grateful you came. Thanks for having me, Karen. Thank you. Mm -hmm.